What's up, world? And welcome to the Y'all Radio Show. This is where we discuss issues pertaining to the socioeconomic system and how they relate to everything. Why and how are the fundamental questions. Answer them enough, you get to the truth. I'm your host, Alex, and welcome back to part two of the episode with Ananda Elise Reeves. We're going to pick up where we left off and talking about patents. Um, You mentioned that at the end of the last episode, and I, I think that's so crucial. It really is. Patents and copyrights, but patents especially. Uh, how big of a deal that actually is, I don't think a lot of people realize, um, because you are essentially monopolizing, you're controlling an advancement for society. You're saying you can only have this advancement if you pay me. Yeah. Yeah. In this world so far, so far, it makes sense because if you live by the money system and, well, yeah, I've invested money or, you know, you didn't actually invest money, but the people you're paying invested money and time and to discover this thing. So in this system, that's where people say, well, yeah, of course, you're not going to give it away. It doesn't make sense. See, but that's why this system doesn't make any sense because – you know, I, I try to relate it to different things. And, and one of the things that, I don't know, simple always comes to mind is, like, say on cars, you know, you have the technology where I've never quite understood, but you have a blind spot in the rearview mirror. But then you have the technology that puts a little indicator when somebody's in that blind spot. But in this system, you have to pay for that. You have to pay extra for that feature. But what that means is I'm less safe, but you're less safe also. So it it just doesn't make sense to me um, to have things controlled like that. It would be so dramatically different if information was freely available. And, you know, and also like if you have two companies, say, for example, competing to uh, make something better and one does, well, they patent it. So then the other company is essentially still working from behind. So all the time, effort, energy, resources they're putting into developing, they're actually working from way back when they could be at the point that that other company was at. So it's very it's very hindering for patents and copyrights. Well, well, and who rules it are are the people that, you know, uh, have the money. Exactly. Exactly. In the in the book, um, they talk about this guy this, who in, he invents a an automobile that doesn't crash into anything, people or animals or buildings. And mm-hmm. and, um, and the book, the, the the billionaires are sitting around. Uh, to, the name of that chapter is "Stump the Billionaires." Mm-hmm. Uh, the billionaires are sitting around, and and, and uh, one of the guy has a huge amount of investment in in the automobile industry and in big oil, and he says. And in the insurance industry, and he says, well, wait a minute, you know, he says, uh, if, if we gave people that much freedom to be able to develop things, uh, things like that, what, what happened to the insurance industry if things didn't crash into things anymore? Uh, you know, that, that's where all my wealth comes from. What would I do without all my wealth from insurance or, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, selling cars and uh, that use gas? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, and the oil companies are behind me and making sure I sell cars, you know, and keep tires on the road and all that stuff. But right. if humanity had the kind of planet that they could invent themselves without the pressure of money, we would be developing things to keep each other safe, like cars that don't crash into things or run over animals. Right. You know? Right. Uh, right. We would be creating things in the book. They developed their own energy system just using the waves of the ocean and that town no longer uses big oil and um which is already a real thing of course with with title yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, it's already real right and yeah it's kind of funny because the reader doesn't know what to do it sometimes because sometimes the book is fictitious fictitious and sometimes it's real right right um, yeah. but the point is it get it rattles people out of their out of their scarcity thinking no, it really does, Ananda. Um, I mean, I sincerely mean that, you know, that um, 
I love it on so many levels. Um, I mean, not only the quality of the research and the writing that you did, um, but how on point it is and how much it does that. I mean, like I said, I, I, I get a lot of this stuff and feel the same way. But even for me, I truly felt, I mean, you made it so much more real. I mean, so much more like inspiring and uh, motivation. Um, but I, I was kind of thinking throughout, you know, here and there, like, yeah, what if I was somebody reading this that I didn't really, but you, you explain it. I mean, it's not, it's not like you just, you know, say this, let's do, it can be done like this. It can be done like that, you know? And then you you'd like leave the reader, you know, okay, well, how do we get there? I mean, because like you said, you basically started from, uh, so-called starting point in the book um, in how it already is. And then throughout the book, that's what the book is. I mean, it goes through how, if it played out in real life, how it would play out. And I think you did a beautiful job of that. And I think anybody who reads it, you cannot not read that and be changed in some way. Again, however that looks, you know, I mean, a different thought process, a different idea, um, a different hope, um, or, or more of those things, you know, or whatever. I, it, it's a, it's a very, very good book on so many levels. <laughs> well, thank you. But like I said, I, I almost don't own credit for it because it came flying through my fingertips like lightning bolts and uh, <laughs> the story that needed to be told and, and uh, I, I just, I kept thinking the whole time I was reading it, that I was reading it as if I were just a, a, a just a common person in a neighborhood that had no clue that there's any choices other than what media says we have. Mm-hmm. And uh, I built my judgments and my prejudice about the system that we have that is broken and it does not work. And the, and the book comes out with, yeah, but what if? Exactly. Yeah. And I I think you did an excellent job of that. That's kind of what I was trying to get at is, like I said before, not only mixing the real people with the so-called imaginary, but with that, too, and how you you it was told very, very well, because you say what needs to be said as far as the ideas, at least that are, you know, the resource management team and how things would look. But a lot of things that you said in there, um, you know, speaking as the the character, basically, you were writing um, at that time, you did. You presented questions that they were essentially asking or saying as though somebody would that that's what somebody would think or what somebody would question at that juncture, you know, and obviously then you kind of go on and elaborate how that would look or or you you went through basically throughout the whole book and you did, you solved the pre- the question that you presented. And that's what I loved about it. Uh, I, I think really, again, you did an excellent job of, of just meshing and blending that the, the real, the imaginary, the um, uninformed and informed, you know, um, it, it was very good. And I know I, I can kind of hear you light up every time you, you think about how that flowed through you and um and I know it's beautiful isn't it I mean when you creativity is definitely um something that I stress for everybody to refine you know you get out of that society purposely gets you out of that through school and stuff and that is what we have uh, an innate ability in humans to create you know I mean that's what we look at and say, look how good and smart we are, because why? Because we've created stuff that wasn't there before. We learned how to take objects and shapes and and, and uh, alter them enough that we can create buildings and cars and satellites. That's what we point to when we say, look how smart we are. Yeah, exactly. And it's creativity. And when it Especially the whole process, you know, you've been through it a lot. The creative process is amazing. It's 
it's so beautiful to build something and, and it's going to suck. Trust me. It's going to suck. I mean, I used, I've done a lot of music in my life and I used to have a, my best friend was one of my producers for a while. One of the things he said always stuck with me. He asked me, he said, every time you sit down to write, you know, do you think like I'm trying to write a hit kind of thing or do you just write? And I told him basically I, I went back and forth with that because I understand I'm into trying to get into the business side of it. And he was just laughing. He said, man, you just write. You just write. He said, do you think people he had a lot more experience than me? He taught me a lot. But he said, do you think even well known it take any artist that, you know, he said, do you think everything they write is a hit? He said they write, you know, whatever, five, ten things that are garbage, but then that one hit. And that's how the creative process works. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it is a process, but it's a beautiful thing, and there's nothing like it. And you get so for, so much fulfillment when you create stuff, especially, obviously, you're going to create the best stuff when it comes, when it's stuff you feel, you know. Yeah. You know, and, and that was exactly the audience that I was aiming at when I wrote this book. I was aiming this book. I was actually concerned and worried about my own mental health. Being home locked in, um, I live by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, I have a beautiful lake to look at. This became my writing studio. But That's point great. was, yeah, I became very concerned for my mental health. If I didn't have something creative to do, during this lockdown, you know, what would happen with my mind? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the aim of the story is to aim at everyone who's locked in and give them some hope, some imagination, and to come away from reading this simple little book with, you know what? I can do something. Right. I can do something to create this change. I can be a part of this. I, there's something that I can create or invent. I don't have to sit here locked in my house and start and, and diminish my mental health or my energy or any of that. There's really something I could actually do. Maybe the only thing I can do after I read this book is just imagine. Well, the, what you're saying, uh, again, is, is a vital point, Ananda, um, the, about the creative process and how it's an outlet. In fact, that is one of the biggest uh characteristics or strengths or whatever of the creative process, it is probably the most fulfilling outlet you can ever do. I mean, just when I was hearing you talk just now, I was reminded this was years ago. My brother, he's five years younger than me. Long story short, of course, basically he was, you know, saying how he was kind of depressed or unhappy and, and all this. And, and I told him, you know, what, what I think, man, you need you don't have any creative outlet. I, you know, it's one thing to play a video game or, you know, I don't anything, do some activity or even drink or whatever. Yes, it's a temporary escape. It is. And that's why, you know, other than just pure enjoyment or entertainment, that's why people do a lot of those things. But then your the game cuts off or you sober up or the workout's done or, you know, and you're back to where you started. And the creative uh, process outlet is, it's so vital. It really, you can release so much through that. Whatever that looks like to you, you know, whatever you truly have a passion for. Um, if people focused more on that, you will see. And it's hard at first because, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. So you have to learn how to do that. And, you know, there's steps and, and techniques and stuff, but you know, it's almost like working out. It's very hard at first and you don't want to do it. You're like, oh, I'd just rather do this or that. You know, something you're uh, comfortable and more familiar with. But after anybody who knows this, too, can verify. But after you do it, you know, several times, it's much, much easier. And you actually get into it more. You feel better, you know, and all that stuff. The creative process is the same. It is hard to start, um, even if you maybe are inspired. You know, typically most people go through that burst at first, right? They're like, because they're excited about it. It's new. It's different. But it is. It takes time, effort, energy, devotion, those things. Um, and so I, I just trying to make a point that um, how important, I, I say this before, so now that we're talking about it, that the creative process, I think, is 
It's vital. And so many people lose it in their life, like I said, because of the way society purposely and the institutions in it purposely dumb you down and numb you and say, I'm not good. I suck. You know, I, I tried to do this or that and let's, it's horrible, you know, and, and you're, you're hard on yourself and negative, but uh, you stick with the creative process, something you truly enjoy. And I a thousand percent promise you it'll get easier. You'll get better. And the fulfillment it will give you will be like nothing you've ever, you've ever experienced if you've never done something like that. Yeah, and, you know, I think about right now, the reality is all of our children in our nation and maybe in most parts of the world are out of school at home. Right. With, and I have a concern for their mental health, you know, for the their ability, because um, I know for a fact they're getting way too much screen time. Right. I know for a fact they're not out there uh, uh, doing things to create a, a new city. They're not out there learning permaculture and planting things. And, uh, you know, I wonder, what are they doing? Right. You know, and if they could just read this book, they would at least come away with dreaming or imagining something different. Which re- brings me into the point of uh, the, the process that the town used um, to, um, to organize themselves. And it, it was really pretty clever, too. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing they did was they... They um, surveyed all of their resources. And so the whole town, everybody put in uh, 10 hours a week of uh, work time towards the town project. And, um, you know, in the book, I actually used some math. If you have a city that's got 50,000 people in it and everybody puts in 10 hours a week, that's 500,000 hours of free labor time that you could be doing to rebuilding your city. Right. And so these people had to spend their their hours, uh, you know, reorganizing their city. And so the first thing they did, one of the things that took up a lot of the hours was surveying everything that they had. So they closed all the thrift stores and they closed all of the um, all of the uh, storage units and they put everything out available and free for everyone. And there was no more paying for things the second time. There was no more storing things and hoarding things. Um, everything was just out in the open. And so this whole town made up the, of these councils that went around and they surveyed different things. Some people surveyed uh, the food situation. Some people surveyed the clothing situation, you know, and, mm-hmm. and then and they came back together and, they, and they, they created designs based on what they needed. And they started to use technology based on what they needed. So uh, in, the, in the story, they, they concluded that there was plenty of enough clothing that they didn't have to build an automated clothing business Mm -hmm. uh, in their town because they had plenty of clothing. So, um, but they did discover that uh, there were some things that they didn't have enough of. And so uh, they created councils with uh, engineers on the councils along with kids and everything else to teach robotics and how to, how to make factories of things that, um, that they could use. And um, in the book, the little girl decides, well, it's not enough just to grow vegetables because the whole town was in, ending up growing their own food. But she wanted a pasta factory because you, can, you don't just eat vegetables, you know. So she went. To, she belonged to this council that had professionals on there that knew robotics. And here's this kid right on the same council with these brilliant engineers learning how to build robotics. And and um, so they built uh, factories that were automated, which took away the the jobs that were. Uh, you know, straining and re- redundant and yeah. and physically hard on people, and they just created the automation to make the jobs. And uh, so anyway, but the main, the first thing they started with is they started surveying the resources in their community. And then, uh, like in the permaculture council, um, they re- they started surveying how much food it would take to supply supply the fam the, the community with, and what they needed for that, and they needed greenhouses. And you know, and they needed things like that. So then they turned it over to designers and engineers that would design the greenhouses to grow the food. And the scientists would study the soil and and um, they would inform the people what kind of soil they had and what kind of things they could plant. So everybody just didn't go out and just uh, start a garden. They went, went through a process of actually doing it in a scientific method so that uh, by the time you were planting things, 
and food and all the yards turned into food instead of yards and grass and and uh, but that all started with doing a uh, a survey of the the resources exactly that's pretty fun which is uh, actually the first step i mean i've given that a it lot of th- right exactly i've given that a lot of thought and obviously you know people who like you that's thought and research and and other thinkers that that is the first step that would be done is um taking an inventory of everything um and knowing what's where what needs are where you know and then again the part two of that or part b i guess i should say of the same thing is um is the distribution and the movement of that and of course we have that it's logistics I mean, yeah. that's why I can order something right now from China and they can tell me within a day or two when it's going to get to me. And it does every time short of some, you know, disaster major thing. But 95 or more percent of the time that product will get there. And that's logistics. That's already established also. So that's how the process essentially would be done. Take the inventory, then the, the needs of everybody and whatnot, and then just distribute accordingly. And. I wanted to say real quick, too, you mentioned about, you know, the the mentioning of kids in the book and how they could even relate. I agree. And that's something else that I really liked about the book. It's uh, you just did a very, very good job of that as well and making it relatable and understandable um, to everybody, to adults and kids. I perfectly could see a kid of, you know, understanding age up, basically reading that and, and understanding it, you know, and coming away with uh, everything that you, that we're saying uh, about the book and what it offers. Um, you, you did a very good job of that. Um, it's, it's definitely for all ages. And, and like I said, very understandable, very relatable because you didn't go off on tangents about, you know, uh, I don't know, big words or big, too big of ideas in that sense, you know? Um, I mean, they're big ideas, but they're very easily understandable and grasp, especially the way you lay it out. Well, and I also mentioned that it was intergenerational. And so in the book, kids come alive with feeling useful and meaningful in their community, rather than being just in a chair, a lot of screen time at home. Uh, And that, and in the book, the elders also start, um, coming alive because mm-hmm. I like um, that. Yeah. He, and there's this one line in there where one of the elders organized, uh, the, the first, uh, interview with Oprah and with all of the resource management team members there. And, and, um, so they, they were announcing this show that's coming up with all of these resource management people on it and Oprah and, you know, don't miss the show and all that. And, and so, uh, after the family saw the announcement, um, they're sitting there and they're saying, wow, that's pretty incredible. I, I wonder who organized all that. And, and the elder in the room stands up and says, oh, just me and my, my little girlfriends, we got together uh, the resource management team in Oprah. <laughs> right. And the guy says, Mom, you did that? And he's, we said, well, I uh, sure did. He says, sure, we're sitting at home playing bingo. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. So the elders come alive because they're given purpose as well, too. Exactly, Ananda. And uh, th- that is... I mean, that in a nutshell is a huge thing with society now on different levels and different uh, uh, reasons or whatever for different people. But most people, that's why they feel what they feel. They feel the disconnect, whether they know it or not. They feel the disconnect. They feel like, you know, what's my purpose? I'm going to work doing this stupid job that, you know, for what, you know, they feel all that. And then of course, right. Like you did, you just mentioned with older or elderly or whatever you want to term you want to use people. I, you know, I can only imagine, I, I see that a lot, you know, and with older people and I know how things play out a lot, you know, I mean, some are fortunate and have their kids always in touch and you know, whatnot, but a lot aren't. And, they are more experienced than everybody else. <laughs> so yeah, right? if so any, why are we ignoring them? Why right. are we giving them a council to be on? Right. You know? Right. And you know, one of the, one of the comments I made that was actually quoted, I thought was pretty cool in several shows back, but it's how I feel 
And I say that, uh, you know, true change will take the knowledge of the old and the energy of the young. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's, a, that's the crux of the whole thing is it's true. Right. And that's that's the reality. You know, um, experience is absolutely priceless. There is no replication for it. And when you realize that and then you realize what I just said that, you know, obviously people that are older have lived longer. They've experienced more. And those are the exact people <laughs> that you should be talking to and gaining knowledge from and insight and their opinions, you know, instead of somebody who happens to have enough money or enough airtime that people's like, well, <laughs> I only have two assholes to vote for, so I'm going to vote for this one. And next thing you know, they're making decisions and running things and they have no knowledge. They have no experience, you know, not to not to mention all the hidden agendas and money taking or whatnot. But yeah, and they're not even in my neighborhood and they're not right. Yeah. I mean, in the book, uh, the neighborhood and the community and the town becomes the pivot point for everything. Right. And um, they they just like I said in the beginning of the show, they create processes that are duplicatable. And so what I'm doing right here in this little town uh, as a result of writing this book, I said, well, you know, I better not talk about other people getting into action. I think I better get into action, too, here, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that uh, three of us are working on, the three of us are reading the book together, and there's only three women here. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the book, it starts with a little family, so, you know, why not? But anyway, um, so we're we're putting together a, a center, like what you said earlier, like a visitor center, an right. education center where people can come in and they can see all these different videos. They can sign up for a council. They can go to the Pulse, which is uh, another whole part of this right. uh, process, is that right in alignment with me writing this book, at the same time, I have the honor of working with um, Mr. David Winter, who's from the U.K., and he's developed a computer program where people can actually go onto his site. It's called the Pulse the rbepulse.com, right. mm -hmm. and you can look at the councils that are there. You can sign up for a council. So as I take these students through the book and they, I give them assignments, one, one of their assignments is go get familiar with the Pulse and sign up for a council. And, um, and so that's their assignment. And then, like I said earlier, one of the other assignments was uh, uh, just use your imagination and appoint your own resource management team. And... Um, so I have to give some kudos out to David Winter, who uh, who birthed the whole process of the Pulse. It's the way of counting people and the, the change agents of the world. Um, uh, he promotes my book in there. In fact, if you go to the Pulse now, you can get my book for free. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and um, and you can go on there and, and you can see what all the different councils are. And he's done just this excellent job of organizing everything. And... Um, I really have to put some uh, some kudos out to him for that. Yes, yes. Uh, I, as we kind of spoke before, I, I am aware of him and and what he's done, and that's that's great. You know, Ananda, like we were saying, everybody. I sincerely believe this. You play a part. You play a role, one way or another. I mean, even if you do nothing, you're playing the nothing role. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everybody. <laughs> Everybody can do something, and it's all steps, it's all processes, and it's all a creative process. And, you know, what he's done, um, I do really need to look into a little more extensively, but I am aware of, of the general premise, like you just explained, and it's great. It's great. that I actually thought of that myself, you know, like there needs to be, or, there, you know, it would be cool to have like a almost like a counting type thing or a registry, um, you know, um, and that's what he's done and yeah. cr created. And it's awesome. Um, he actually contacted me about my block. <laughs> so I, I have a block on the block already. Um, actually, that's how I found you is that you're on the pulse. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I, yeah. I was meaning to ask you, I was curious to that. Okay. Oh, well, see, very cool. That just shows you the, you know, the reach. and Yeah, and uh, so someone can pick up this book or they can tune into the to the radio station where I'm going to be reading it out loud and they can 
they can get involved with the book and we'll, we'll form, you know, discussion groups and we'll have call-in talks. But the bottom line is when you're done reading this book, you can go get involved. You can join a council and you can start being an active world citizen. Yes. Well, we're actually going to get to the call to action right here in just one second. I just quickly wanted to ask you about, because I was unfamiliar with the term, um, the sociocracy. So I, I, yeah, I looked it up and I was quite interested. I see it's relatively newer. Supposedly it was started, I think in the sixties by a, a PhD or somebody, but Anyway, I did watch a, a shorter video of a guy on YouTube explaining it, and I'm like, wow, this is like what most people like us are kind of advocating for. So it's very interesting. One of the things that stuck out to me was that they said it's not majority decision. It's by consent. Right. By consent. Because if you have a majority decision, you still essentially have a hierarchy or whatever you want to term that. Exactly. So I thought that was very interesting. And I know you've, you know, more about it than me, obviously. So what is it in general, other than what I said? And how does that work? I mean, just by consent and not a majority? Um, well, uh, the first design is that it's designed in circles, just just matches the whole council outline perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the circles are small. Right. Because, um, the idea is that everyone has a voice, and so it's facilitated in a way where everyone gets to speak. And so, if you're on a uh, if you're on a council and and uh, you've got an agenda and you need and the, and that ultimate goal is that you'll come to a conclusion on something or make a decision on something, you just you go in rounds of people, and you keep going in rounds until you come to a point of consent. Now, that's not the same as consensus. Consensus is we all have to agree or we, it doesn't fly. So right. an example of that would be I was, in, I was consulting with a um, uh, co-housing community one time, and it came time for them to put the roof on their common house, and they would have gotten a really big discount if they got uh, these red tiles for their roof. And so the whole community had to decide if, what color they wanted their roof to be on, on, the, on the house, and they, reached, they went by consensus, Right. So, which meant that everyone had to agree or it wasn't going to fly. I see. Um, and it took a long time. And so finally, you know, the people who really showed up at more meetings and had more say ended up getting the red roof on top of the common house. Consensus is where um, you come to a point where you realize I can live with that. Or you, you come to a, a, a point where it's not your way, um, but you can see the, the, the point of it. Right. And uh, it, it, so it comes to a point of something that you can that you can live with or that that it would be OK if it went that way. Um, and so the beautiful part about the circle facilitation is that no one has to interrupt you because you're going to get your turn. Right. And so so much more is done much more efficiently if, first of all, everyone feels heard. And secondly, uh, everyone gets to have a voice. Mm hmm. And so in the book, we're designing all of these councils, which, which, is, the, which is the core um, structure to our new world, is that everything's done in circles and councils, and we come to consensus about things. And um, the worst that could happen is you, everyone gets behind all this, and we form all these councils, and then they don't know how to talk to each other. Right. Or they don't know how to listen to each other, which is even deeper. Exactly, and so you right. Have same old shit coming in to the committee meetings. Uh, with people in their majority rule mentality, and and they don't know how to listen to each other or talk. So one of the one of the uh, recommended steps for everyone joining a council is they go through the sociocratic training, which is uh, real. You can actually do that. There's books on it, tapes on it. There's lots and lots of uh, information on it, mm -hmm. and you can actually learn how to be a really good council member by learning the sociocratic process. I see. So um, it's designed to let everybody have a voice. And in the book, children are on councils. And right. they've never really been given the voice before. And so uh, it took a while for them to learn how to, how to counsel together uh, and get things done. 
So they have a, the real experience of that in the book. Well, it would but, take. Go ahead. I was just going to say it, it would take anybody uh, learning. And like you just touched on a minute ago that, um, th- you know, I, any of us, I mean, even me and you, anybody, it, it's very ingrained how we are. Uh, and, and so that you would have to learn a different way because we're so used to things like majority decision. And, and that's why that was interesting to me, actually, because I've given it a lot of thought, but I've, when I kind of thought, I'm like, well, yeah, you, you'd have to sort of vote, right? I mean, you have to kind of come to a dis- majority decision. Um, but how does that, how, with that being said, how does that work in that case like say you're trying to i get the consent now you explained it very well so that's sort of how i interpreted it you know um you kind of are part or affiliated with things that you're interested in so you're going to be better at and more passionate and all that stuff i get that part of the consent and then i get the after the fact like okay maybe it's not what i wanted but hey it's still all good you know those things and you sort of live with it um, but how would an ultimate decision be made, though, in that case? If it's not majority, then who would ultimately decide? Well, the, the circle decides, and the facilitator uh, keeps doing the rounds. It keeps going around and around until people can come to a, a, a mutual agreement. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Well, and that, uh, too, I kind of wanted to mention. So you're saying about the smaller circles, which, of course, makes sense because – you know, you have to take the environment and all that good stuff and resources into account. But, you know, I, if you live 2,000 miles away from me, I don't too much care what you do. You know, if you live right, right next to me, yeah, you know, we have to decide together what's going on around here. So, uh, yeah, that that makes sense. It, it's essentially um, smaller circles that kind of decide their thing that as long as it uh coincides with the environment and stuff like that right yeah and so so for example um let's say um that our council was going to decide something that has to do with um uh, an environmental safety to our neighborhood Mm -hmm. it's a big topic um you know and so um the first round uh people would just go around and, and and they would get informed about what it was and then um, let's say that on the council is someone who's an uh, environmental engineer. He might speak up and say, well, this is, this is a good idea scientifically because of this and this, and, um, and it might change your mind. And so you go the circle around again and you say, well, how many would consent with that? And you realize, well, there's a risk here that I'm not feeling safe about because actually it's going to end up hurting people or whatever, you, could, you know, whatever the mm-hmm. case is. Yeah. And so – you get facts along the way, and then you go around again after someone's expressed the fact. You will see now how many now how many people how many want a thumbs up on that one, and it ends up being like, well, I don't actually want that because I didn't realize the consequences or I didn't realize the facts, and so um, you just keep going around in the circle until you can feel good about what's being passed. Now you don't have to agree, but you can feel good about it. Right. So. Uh- That's a good way to explain it, actually, a very good way um, about how it just keeps going. It essentially never stops and it keeps evolving, changing, uh, getting better, which is, of course, how things should be. Right. And that is essentially the scientific method. I mean, um, that's what separates science from most things, because most things are absolute, which makes no sense. And why, to me, it's literally common sense to think like the, quote, scientific method, because all that's saying is I'm going to take what information I do have up to this point on this subject or topic or whatever. I'm going to use the best thought I can and experiment and maybe incorporate other minds into this. We're going to test theory, hypothesize, experiment and figure it out. You know, it's like a reality based thought process. Yeah. And so you, you might be on a council that has some research to do and you reconvene at a time when the research has been done. And then, uh, you know, then the people in the council have the freedom to be able to say, okay, now that you've learned all these facts, how are we doing on a vote? And you keep testing the waters to see, are we getting close to consensus? 
are we, I'm not consistent, are we getting close to consent? Right. And you'll do a temperature check. The, the, the facilitator will do what they call a temperature check. And, they, and they'll go around and say, just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down on how, and how ready you are to start make, making this consent, coming to a consent. Right. And, you know, all your thumbs are down, you go, okay, we've got more work to do. Let's keep going around then. Right. And, uh, and then slowly, you know, the thumbs get more and more up and then pretty soon it's, you know, okay, I think we're ready to consent. And then the facilitator would reiterate, um, what it is that we're consenting on and and then it comes to a a decision. It's absolutely brilliant. It it is. It is. I love it. I want to take my hat off to John Buck right now. I met him at that same uh, communities conference back in uh, Virginia at the East Wind community when uh, he just launched the sociocracy process. I met him back in those days and he was um, giving workshops on it. Oh, really? Yeah. I've even appointed him to the, to the uh, resource management team because yeah. uh, he's, he knows all about communication because we can't figure out, we can't put together a new system for our, for our country. You know, the people, how the people, elected new systems for a president we can't put in new systems unless we know how to uh consult and 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 you know make the systems make the circles productive exactly communication runs the nation key absolute key and so one of the um requirements of being on a council is you go through sociocracy training and so the vision is that we've got our whole entire nation running on councils that have to do with your own local town and how it affects you personally and your family, your environment, your block, you know, mm-hmm. your town. And that every decision that is made for your town is made by a, a council of people who are knowledgeable in their field and came to a consent together. Yeah, that is. That's going to make me feel like an American citizen. Right. Yeah. When you really sincerely feel like you have a voice and a say and yeah, that's, that's great. That is a, that's, is a big one. I mean, like I said, I was very interested the more I was reading and watching the video on sociocracy and um, yeah, mental is, I mean, it's, it's physical and mental, right? That's the two key elements. So it's one thing to plan. Of course, Jacques Fresco was very uh, mental. I know he studied psychology and whatnot, but kind of use him as a reference that it's one thing to, you know, make the structures. That's one part of it. And then the systems design, you know, of, of efficient moving and, and stuff, that's another, but the thought is almost everything. I mean, it's kind of like you said earlier about um, the listening is almost, is more important than the talking. I mean, y- you have to be open-minded and receptive to new ideas and change and understand that change is good and it's inevitable. And remember that our our future uh, our future America and I say this because I, we're only talking about America for the time being, but it's actually a global issue. Right, right. Uh, uh, keeping things at home first, we'll figure it out here first, and the rest of the world will catch on. Right. Uh, but um, so remember that uh, in this future time, when we've got councils running our our country, literally from the local level all the way up, mm-hmm. uh, they won't. Ha- be having to consider the money element. Right. Because when you're making decisions about your town, about an alternative energy system, and it's going to cost billions of dollars to build this dam or whatever it is that you're going to be working with, well, if money is no longer part of our world, we don't have to consider the money that we need to build what we need for alternative energy. We only have to consider the resources technology and the manpower exactly the all the correlations to the actual real physical world Um, exactly right right we won't have to consult on should we repair this uh pothole in our street because it's going to cost lots of money yeah that's actually a good analogy ananda um i've seen that before whatever but you know so many things of course we could mention but Something like that, right? I mean, it's people's like, well, we got to vote. We have to decide. Well, there's other things to fix. Well, really, the only question should be, how many people does it take? Three? It takes a truck. It takes some fucking gravel. It takes some. It's a very quick thing. It it could be done. Yeah. But there's so much bureaucracy, red tape, and, of course, money 
that doesn't make any sense. It it just it totally throws off even the simplest of tasks. Yeah, exactly right. And so if we don't have money as as part of our decision making process, we can move forward just to using resources, humanity and technology. And Jacques Fresco says over and over again, and I say it over and over again in my book, Mm -hmm. it takes a while for it to sink in. But the point is, Jacques Fresco says we have plenty of resources, plenty of technology and plenty of manpower to completely rebuild our cities in a sane way. And that is literally, Ananda, you know this as you're stressing now, but that is the key. That is the key. That's the difference maker. And again, so many times, almost everybody that I confront about this in one way or another, they clearly don't grasp that because they'll reference all these other things, you know, well, if. Uh, I need to work more because I need the money or, well, if I have, you know, this and they won't, if this person has it, that's what changes everything. And that's where our society has gotten to that we, we know now that there's enough resources all over the planet. We know we, you know, how to do things efficiently, you know, build greenhouses straight up and you don't irrigate ridiculous amounts of land and use ridiculous amounts of water. It doesn't make any sense. I, there's yeah. so many things, but that is the key. I, I, I know, and that's why Jock stressed it. That's why you're stressing it. You mentioned, like you said several times throughout the book, it really is. That is what the game changer that people really need to understand. If you don't, take it upon yourself. If you care enough, it's easy to see and learn and, under, and figure it out that there is enough resources. There is enough technology. There is enough know-how. For abundance, there is already abundance. But that's there already the, is abundance, absolutely. And the, the thing with the mindset is we have to get out of the scarcity exactly. mindset because the scarcity is only attached to money. Exactly. There isn't any scarcity attached to nature. A hundred percent, Ananda. Very well said, yes. And right now we are we're getting close to the end here. We're going to f- conclude with a call to action. But real quick, I just want to do a show segment. Um, it's, it's called the curious five. Uh, so I just want to get into that right now. And, of course, that sound means it's time for the Curious Five. Uh, I haven't actually mentioned it, but I'll just say it now for those who don't know. That was from an old Transformers movie, the original. I grew up on them. It's a big part of it. I love it. But anyway, so what this is, Ananda, and for anybody who doesn't know, this is just the Curious Five. We just ask you five personal preference questions. You can be as whatever, short, brief, or as extended as you want. Um, So the first question is, do you have a favorite or least favorite accent? You mean a speaking accent? Yeah, uh like a nationality sort of accent. Oh, well, um, my least favorite accent is the southern accent, and I'll tell you why. (laughs) You and me both. (laughs) My, my, uh, my... Author name is Ananda, mm-hmm. and uh, you give it great honor by pronouncing it Ananda because it means bliss and joy. And when I go south, they say Ananda. <laughs> right. What you doing, little old Ananda? <laughs> oh, well said. <laughs> it, it just takes away all the, the oomph from it, huh? <laughs> right. Yes. Uh I know. It's funny because another guest, she couldn't come up with one, but she said, uh, maybe that, you know? And, uh, yeah, uh, it takes the ring out of a lot of things. Okay. That's interesting. Do you happen to have a favorite one that stands out to you or? I like, uh, I like the, uh, New Zealand uh, accent or way of speaking more. Right. Because they, they speak to each other in very warm tones. They'll call each other doll. Or, uh, or hun, mm-hmm. uh, like they'll say, well, it's over there, doll. Or, doll, could you bring me this uh, glass of water or something? I see. So they speak 
to each other using, um, uh, what's the word, using uh, loving terms yeah. in with their language. And I love that. I see. I like that too. I like the actually the term you used at first, warm tones. That 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 was nice. Um, okay, yeah, very cool. I, I like them for different reasons also, but um was a little unfamiliar with that, so that's cool. All right. Uh the second one is do you have a favorite or least favorite food or cuisine? Well, actually, yes, I'm a vegan and I uh, did read that, yep. Yes, I love that because I don't have to look at my plate and know that an animal was mistreated. Right. That's a big one. No animals get to be mistreated on my plate. That's beautiful. That's a big one. That's very nice. Yeah. I don't think there's anything to say other than that. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a good one. Yes. I, I am with you on that. I mean, we could factory farming. Anybody who knows is... Everything but positive. It's all negative, basically. So, um, well, that's great. My um, my sister, one of my sisters and her three kids are all vegetarians, and they both are in different stages of different, you know, vegan and whatnot, too. So, um, yeah, it's very good. Okay, a third one is, do you have a favorite or least favorite music or genre? Um, my most or least favorite music or genre? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have to honestly say that uh, folk music is my favorite. Oh, okay. Because it, um, it tells st stories that, um, that resonate with me. Right. Um, in in folk music, you don't get heartbreaks, you don't get cheating and lying and <laughs> and stealing and violence and mm -hmm. words you can't understand or hear. Right. Um, so I, I love folk music. Yeah, very cool. That's, I mean, I'm sure it's still done and made, but uh, I almost want to say like a, a, a lost art sort of thing. Um, uh yeah, actually that's an interesting one, Ananda. I've one I haven't given a whole lot of thought to recently, but um yeah, folk music is very cool for those reasons and, and very unique. And definitely almost everyone tells a story. So yeah, that's very cool. Okay, fourth one. Do you have a favorite or least favorite color? We're going back to elementary school. <laughs> yeah, uh, purple's because um, actually purple is one of nature's favorite colors. Mm. There's more purple um, on the planet as far as color goes than any other color. Really? Even and green or blue? Uh, well, uh, well, no. I mean, as far as growing. Oh, uh, okay. I got you. Right. Not like the sky and the water and the trees, but plants. I got you. And animals. Really? Have what? more purple in them than any other color. What purple animals are there? Well, they have a, a lot of birds. Um, well, have yeah. hues of different color purple. Um, yeah, but, and um, a lot of bugs, believe it or not. Not necessarily ones that we see all the time, but the really right. rare bugs have purple in them. Yeah. Uh, iguanas and, and uh, what do they call those? Uh, Animals that change color. Sort of exotic, like uh, yeah, yeah. I birds are awesome. They're one of the most uh, diverse color type uh, species, and I, I I'm aware of some of the stuff you're talking because I love nature things, you know, um, shows and documentaries, and uh, yeah, it's so amazing. And that's something else I think people have lost touch with, you know. Um, you watch some of those, you know, especially the good ones, you know, the earth ones or, you know, whatever. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. I mean, the creatures, the species, how they look, how they act, how they live. It, you're, it almost feels like another world because I think in general, so many people are so disconnected with that, with nature. Um, so. Well, an example of how they've used technology to study science, because nowadays they, the filming apparatuses they have can be so tiny. They can get right in and right. seeing different kinds of uh, animal life we've never even seen before. A very true. Very good point. That's that's right. Uh, that's what blows my mind. I mean, 
everything I just said, but a lot of that, right, the detail and the focus, like you, you mentioned, the, the cameras can get and the quality, of course, of the video, it's stunning. It really is. Um, it's breathtaking and it's beautiful to see that stuff. Um, yeah. so that's, that's a, that's a good point on that. You know, that's what, again, enables us to do that now. Well, and what humans have done with the color purple has made it, um, either spiritual or, or royal. That's true. Yeah. That's another good point. That's right. Those, I think most people, if they gave it thought, that's what they would probably associate purple with and then lavender maybe, you know, but, um, yeah, yeah. Well, they must like it too. Then if they're trying to make it royalty, I mean, <laughs> and purple definitely has that royalty look, doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah. something about it. It's, it's like a very full, robust, whole type of color. I don't know. And it's very cool. Yeah. And Prince thought so too, apparently, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, last one here on the Curious Five is do you or what is your natural fear? Fear? Mm-hmm. Like do you have just a, I don't know, a natural fear or something you kind of fear in general or? Yeah, here's what I'm afraid of. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid people won't read my book and they won't wake up. That's a That's a real one. Yep. And it's not just my book, but they don't, the, the whole general don't wake up. My fear is that we're going to have the same system again that we've had over and over again that does not work. And my fear is that humanity will not step into using their power to change things. They'll just stay asleep. And that is a big fear for me. <clears throat> wow. I felt that one, Ananda. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a big one for me. I'm, the way I kind of describe it to a lot of people is really I I people the few people that know me I'm very fun funny I know how to have a good time all that good stuff, but ultimately if you ask where my heart lies it's what we're talking and everything else to me is secondary mm -hmm. because I feel that way too I mean um, it is everything when you realize what it could be and the potential and how dramatically things would be different in all positive ways, basically. Um, it's a very real thing. And so I, I, I feel you there. And that's actually a great way to kind of transition here and sort of uh, conclude with um, the call to action that we want to put out there because like so many of us know, um, you've mentioned earlier that um, – even people who care, understand, want to get involved, you know, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, how can, you know, an organization or something, give me an idea or what can I do? And um, I know you have a, a lot of ideas on that. Um, so uh, what would you suggest or like to say to that, to somebody who would ask you that? Well, um, so the call to action that I would like to see people do. Mm-hmm is, uh, you know, we've mentioned so many heroes mm -hmm. on this show today. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I would invite people to start investigating. It's easy to do. We live in an information age. You right. can find out any information you want about uh, the Ubuntu contributionism, the Venus Project, um, Jock Fresco, um you know, the World Summit is uh, shining bright out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pulse is uh, a place where you can actually go to and register to get involved with councils. Um, you know, and of course, I would say uh, I would love to have reading circles with my book. I, I would read my book several times a day uh, to listening audiences, you know, all covering the same chapter at the same time, um, because every chapter talks about how how they did it and um, the the end of the chapter everyone's got an action step about how they can do it mm -hmm. and um, you know just uh, keep keep your eyes open investigate um, keep your heart open and and you know step up yeah yeah that's that was great Ananda that was a great way to conclude and um uh, you mentioned 
a ton of great stuff in here. I mean, uh, the call to actions just now, um, some of the more specific uh, organization websites. And I do also just want to say that I think that was something else that I actually learned from your book was the way you had the characters um, go through the whole process, um, essentially from idea to manifestation. Um, and the, um, well, the, the, the actions, you know, that they went through and then they had actions at the end, like you said, where everybody had a specific, you know, goal or a specific, um, you know, way to go. It was like, we're trying to say here, that uh it's vital and um i just really thank you so much for being on the show um reaching out to me it's really been a, a great show and it's been great talking with you you're an amazing person the book is amazing i highly suggest people to check it out it's a great read honestly it's very thought out well written the link will be along with a few others, but it will be in the description, um, uh, that you can go get it. It's, it's, it's very cheap if you want to purchase it. Um, it's well worth it. Um, not only, you know, for what it is, but for the effort you put in, um, I mean, people would pay for other stuff, you know, I mean, you're charging a, a dollar or two. I mean, come on. It's, it's like, you know, you lose that in the couch, literally, and, and if not, if you go to the RB Pulse, you said, you know, it's available there. Um, but uh, it's just been a great, great pleasure and honor talking with you. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to be on the show with me. Well, thank you so much for your time. You've been a great host. And uh, we hit on uh, not only all the points I wanted to hit on, but uh, we also, you know, had some good chats about um, things related to the topic as well, too. And um, I'd like to say as a, a, a closing, and it's not enough just to buy the book, but get involved in a reading circle with it. Right. Um, if I'm not reading it out loud to you, um, you know, get get a group together and read it out loud together. Give yourself some assignments after every chapter to, to, to get into action. And, um, you know, uh, don't sit in a corner by yourself and read that book. It's meant for you and your neighborhood, you and your people. Keep going forward, right? I mean, that's what it's Absolutely. all about. Yeah. And if you read, uh, if you go to my Facebook, you'll be able to see when I have scheduled readings for the book. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from, because if I get uh, 10 people in the class and they're from different parts, they're going to be um, directed to go out to their own neighborhood and put together some of this action. So it doesn't matter where everybody's from. They'll all come together eventually. Well said, Ananda. Thank you again for everything. And um I, I really do hope people take the time uh, to not only check all that out, read the book, but like you said, keep going forward. I mean, we're given this life and don't waste it. Absolutely. Couldn't say it better. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for listening. Ananda's book is all about dreaming big and using your imagination. The right to dream cannot be taken by anyone. Build in your mind a beautiful, wonderful reality and totally different from the bleak reality of your outer world. You have all the tools of creation at your disposal, your thoughts and your imagination. Start in your mind, set goals, and manifest it to reality. Please feel free to email, follow, share, comment, like, subscribe. I welcome any and all feedback or support. And I hope you'll tune in next time for another episode of the All Real Show. We are...